thousands of people are still desperately scrambling to leave Afghanistan via the capital's airport. In the midst of the chaos, the US has now advised its citizens to avoid travelling to Kabul airport unless they have individual instructions to do so. Meanwhile, the man considered to be the political leader of the Taliban, Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, arrived in Kabul for talks on forming a government. It's another sign of the Taliban tightening its grip on power there after its rapid takeover of the country. Well, let's speak to our correspondent, Dan Johnson, who's watching events, monitoring events for us from uh, Delhi. Uh, Dan, uh, just give us the latest on the situation uh, at the airport. It still seems to be rather chaotic and, and unpredictable. Yes, the scenes outside the airport have been crowded and chaotic all week, but it does sound like the situation there has got particularly grim today. There are photographs on social media in the last hour or two showing US or UK soldiers, it's not quite clear, actually uh, retrieving bodies from the crowd. So it sounds like the crush has got so great there, the conditions are so intense, it is really hot, people have been stood waiting around all day and it sounds like more lives are being lost there in the queue, the crush, the crowd of people who are desperately trying to make it through the gates to make it onto those evacuation flights out of Afghanistan. This situation hasn't really improved much all week and that is why in the last few minutes there's been that security update from the US Embassy in Kabul telling US citizens not to put themselves in that situation for the time being, just to stay away from the airport, especially the crowded areas around the gates uh, where people are expected to present to try to get through. We know the Taliban checkpoints have been an issue for some people, particularly for Afghans, even if they have uh, the permits and are eligible to get through to leave the country. Uh, they've been stopped, questioned, had documents checked in some cases. They've been held so long that they've missed the flight they were supposed to be on. Some have been turned back. There was a report this morning that a group of 150 Indians had been detained by the Taliban. The group denied that it had kidnapped any foreigners, but did say that it was questioning people as they attempt to leave the country. And that will be of serious concern because many of those Afghans who want to get out need to do so quickly and without declaring to the Taliban what their reason for doing that is, because presumably it would link them straight away either to the previous government or to work they've done for uh, the services, the armed services from different nations in the past. So a really tricky situation at the airport that still shows no sign of improvement. Uh, and then where are we in terms of the latest on the efforts of the, uh, the Taliban leadership to form uh, any sort of government there? We've had no update on the progress of these talks that are said to have started in Kabul today. We know that one of the Taliban's most senior leaders, the, the, the second in command, the political leader, uh, if you like, uh, Mullah Barada, has arrived in Kabul for those talks, expected to include all the different groups representing minorities and different factions across the country, uh, including voices like Hamid Karzai, the previous president, a moderate voice, uh, but also people like Khalil Haqqani. He's one of the US's most wanted terrorists. There's a $5 million bounty on his head, and yet he could be integral now to talks about forming a government for the future of Afghanistan. The Taliban has said it wants it to be an inclusive government, but it will stagger some people that inclusive means terrorists who've in some cases served long prison sentences. Barada himself was in prison uh, for eight years. So interesting moves, uh, controversial moves, uh, but we don't have any update yet on the progress as to actually what sort of structure we're going to see, what form of government will actually come out of this, but uh, certainly those moves are, are being made now as the Taliban seeks to exert power right across the country. And it has said it will include voices from the former government because essentially it needs some experience, it needs some knowledge of the power structure in the country for things just to be able to carry on. Uh, but in the interim, uh, the situation is uncertain and security-wise about as tense as it's been. Okay, Dan, thank you very much. Dan Johnson, our correspondent, monitoring developments for us from Delhi. Well, as we were hearing there, Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar has arrived in Kabul for talks on forming a government. But who is he and why is his arrival so significant? He's among the few dozen original members of the Taliban. In his early 50s, he co-founded the Taliban group and is one of the best known. Reported to have been one of Mullah Omar's most trusted commanders, he fled to Pakistan after the US invasion in 2001 
and was arrested in 2010 by security forces in an operation then considered to have dealt a fatal blow to the movement. Mullah Baradar was released in 2018 and moved to Qatar at the request of the US to help bolster support for talks with them, acting as the Taliban's chief ambassador. At one point, he spoke to President Trump on the phone. He's been part of the Taliban negotiating team in Doha, where he oversaw the signing of the withdrawal agreement with the Americans. I'm joined now by Professor Michael Semple of Queen's University, Belfast. He's also a former Deputy European Union envoy uh, to the country. It's good to have you with us. Um, uh, what do you make of uh, Baradar, his history, and the sort of um, leader that he might emerge as in, Af in Afghanistan? Well, it's absolutely fascinating to see Mullah Brother uh, arriving in Kabul to, to join the fray of Taliban politics. Uh, certainly, he has functioned as the head of the Taliban political office uh, since uh, 2018 when he was released from jail. Uh, but it's by no means a foregone conclusion that he will actually emerge as some kind of president at the head of a government. Um, that really depends on the, the negotiations, not between Taliban and you know, other political forces in Afghanistan, uh, but on the, sort of the, the maneuverings and the negotiations within the Taliban movement itself. Uh, to get an idea of where Mullah Brother has come from, uh, he started the, the jihad against the Soviets in its final years as a humble foot soldier doing guard duty outside of the door of senior commanders. When Mullah Umar uh, launched his rebellion against the, the, sort of the, the warlords who were left over from that jihad in 1994, he was one of his closest aides. He, ra he rose to become the deputy army chief during the Taliban administration of 1996 to 2001. During that period, he was known as a tough commander. For example, as a UN official in those years, I investi investigated several massacres conducted by Taliban forces, uh, and specifically one of those massacres in the, the northern town of Kaisar, uh, with in the order of 2,000 people uh, summarily executed. The commander in charge of the force um, who uh, carried out that massacre was the same Mullah brother. Uh, but then when we came to the um, to the era of the insurgency, he headed up the insurgency in its early years uh, as the um, oh, yeah, and that was and that was uh, the, his capacity when he was finally arrested from the okay. by the um, uh, American American and Pakistani joint operation. Uh, the The reason that he the reason that he has a claim to power just now is because at that time he was appointed as deputy by the original Taliban leader Mullah Umar. That's his claim to legitimacy, but he's not the only contender. Okay. In which case, um, what are the prospects of a a proper civilian government being formed? Is there likely to be a, a power struggle? Uh, you know, will they accept a sort of a broad-based uh, coalition of differing views on where Afghanistan should be going? They. The Taliban leadership had an option to pursue an orderly transition, some kind of a peace process, uh, power sharing with other political forces in Afghanistan by uh, engaging sincerely in, in the talks in Qatar. They chose not to exercise that option. Instead, in Qatar, they stalled and their armed forces grabbed power on the ground. Now, the vast majority of the men who grabbed power in Kabul a little under a week ago have no intention whatsoever of seeing a coalition government. They do not want to see any dilution whatsoever of Taliban power. As far as they're concerned, Kabul and Afghanistan more generally are the spoils of war which they should enjoy solely without sharing any power. So, of course, you are correct that there is a lot of talk in Western media and still among some of the old, um, the old Afghan politicians that there is still a hope for a power sharing government. There has been no evidence so far of any compromise on the Taliban side. And if Mullah Brader decides to propose it, as he said he would in talks in Qatar, he may well find himself the subject of a power struggle with all mm. those Taliban fighters who think, no, we've grabbed everything. Why should we why should we allow those corrupt former politicians to come back in just after we've defeated them? OK, um, just briefly, um, what, what do you think the, the 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 biggest risk is at this time, at this moment? 
Well, the biggest risk faced by the Afghan population, frankly, is hunger, because the, this has been a chaotic transition. The, um, the economy is now in free fall. Millions of Afghans barely know where their next meal is going to come from. So the biggest risk actually for Afghans um, yeah, is that uh, the, nothing, there no government will be in place uh, which can put the economy back together, get trade moving, find some access to external finance, start start paying people. That's the you know that's the risk. But as as we speak today, I think we should recognise today Afghanistan is a failed state, and the biggest risk is that it will not actually emerge from that state for a long time to come. Okay, Professor Michael Semple from Queen's University Belfast. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Welcome.